How's everybody doing? You guys been hanging out at the White House? Have they been treating you well? You guys good? You guys comfortable? We heard you up there jamming. It was a good way to start the morning. So welcome to the White House, everybody. I hope everybody's treating you well. Uh, I want to start by thanking the Thelonious Monk Institute of Jazz, as well as the folks at UNESCO and so many others who've made this day possible. This is going to be a really good day. And we're starting out with you guys. You look so handsome. Uh, I want to thank our, our incredible artists who are with us. We've got Herbie Hancock, Dee Dee Bridgewater, Bobby Watson, and Terrence Blanchard. And we're also going to have a group of amazing students who are studying jazz at UCLA. Where are the, where are the students? You, the, you, you, don't, you look like grown people. <laughs> you also look like students. Well, welcome. Welcome. It's great to have you all here. Thank you so much. You know, this is a busy day, and the fact that these guys are taking this morning to be with you when they're going to be playing all through the night is a real testament to uh, how excited they are to, for our young generation, you guys. And you guys are really the star of the show today. So we welcome students who are here from high schools from the DC, Virginia, and Maryland areas. Are you guys all studying music or are you just sort of hanging out at the White House? <laughs> So I hope this is as exciting a day for you as it is for me. Um, today we are uh, just uh, aren't just celebrating a uniquely American art form. Uh, we're also honoring the history and the people who shaped the art form into what it is today. And that history goes way back, as many of you know, if you were students of jazz, it unfolded in smoky dance halls in New Orleans and in clubs in Harlem and in simple shacks all throughout the, the South where African-American artists drew on our nation's diverse cultural heritage to invent a new kind of sound. And it's a blend of irresistible rhythms and irrepressible creativity, but jazz is also described as America's greatest uh, contribution to the arts. But of course, while the music may have started here in America in years since, it's truly become uh, a globally inspired piece of uh, work. Jazz is now performed and treasured by folks of every background in just about every part of the world. So to honor and help continue this proud legacy, today we are celebrating the fifth annual International Jazz Day. Yeah. And we, we've been working on getting this done for a little bit. So I am thrilled that this is happening, that Washington, D.C. was selected as the host city this year. And we are so excited to be putting on just a big, huge jazz concert here at the White House tonight. You saw that. I won't call it a tent, because it's more like a structure that's on the South Lawn where the concert's going to be held. This show is just one of thousands of performances and celebrations happening all across the globe in 190 countries on six continents today. So it turns out that just about everybody loves jazz, right? <laughs> and I, I am absolutely no exception. I grew up in a jazz household. Everybody knows I grew up on the south side of Chicago. I tell this story always because truly, <laughs> jazz was the music I was raised on. My mother's father, my grandfather, who we called south side, now that's a jazz lover's name. <laughs> Southside was a carpenter, and he built a makeshift jazz studio in his little two-bedroom house where all the kids, my, my mother came from a big family of seven brothers and sisters, but this was a two-bedroom house. He had a wall of jazz. He had mix-matched uh, turntables, a reel-to-reel, -reel, and he uh, connected speakers into every room in the house. I mean, literally, that was surround sound before we even knew what it was. <laughs> they weren't all the same brand. Some speakers were found in the alley. Some people, some speakers were given to him. But my grandfather would wake up every single morning and he would turn on jazz. And he would blast it at the highest possible volume that he could get away with. So I really grew up 
with jazz as kind of the backdrop to my childhood. We all gather at his house, and whether we were unwrapping Christmas presents, it was Miles Davis playing. If it was birthday celebration, it was Charlie Parker. Uh, I just came to grow up loving jazz. My father was a jazz lover, and of course I married a man who was a jazz lover too, the President of the United States, who is looking forward to tonight. So jazz has really fueled my life in ways that I can't describe. It's the, it just generates all these memories for me uh, from my childhood. And all these years later to have the world's greatest jazz musicians play a concert in our backyard, and I do mean our, the nation's backyard, on Duke Ellington's birthday, uh, no less, is really kind of an amazing full circle moment for me and I know for so many people. And I'm especially thrilled to share this passion with so many uh, DC's students on DC's college signing day which is why everybody is wearing their college gear. For those of you who don't know what college day is, this is the day that a lot of students declare where they're going to college. You guys look awesome in your gear. It's a good thing. Um, and I have a college-bound student who will be declaring soon. But I think that it just means a lot. It's a perfect combination to be celebrating College Signing Day with International Jazz Day. Because no matter what you want to do in your life, whether it's to be a jazz musician or an entrepreneur or a scientist or a teacher, you're gonna need a good education. And everybody on this stage understands that. You are going to need to get an education beyond high school. And at the same time, we also know the power of bringing the arts into our schools. And I can't say this enough here, um, but the arts cannot be an option for our kids. It's got to be a necessity, just like math and science and reading and all that kind of stuff. Arts has to be a part of that because we know that students who get involved in things like music or drama or visual arts, they just do better. The studies are clear. They have better grades. They have better graduation rates. They have better college enrollment rates. Music and arts is a foundation for an outstanding ex uh, education. And that's why as soon as we got to the White House, we started hosting these workshops during the day when we would have music series in the evenings. We actually kicked things off in 2009 with a jazz workshop. That was the very first workshop that we did. And since then, we have celebrated every art form, music form from ballet to country music to gospel to Broadway. And every single time we bring kids here uh, like you guys, to spend time with the talent who takes their mornings on a busy day to be with you all. So we're grateful to have you. Uh, and at every event, we've highlighted the transformative, transformative power of education because if you complete your education past high school, there is really nothing that you can't do. But we emphasize this because a high school diploma these days is not enough. It, but a four-year high school isn't the only thing you, you need to do. There are many ways to get that education, whether it's a four-year school, a two-year community college, a training program, what have you, but high school is not enough. And that's the message that we send to kids as much as we can and to families to understand the importance that education has in, in young people's lives. The lives of the musicians on this stage are a testament to that truth. Uh, Bobby Watson started his career in the world-famous jazz program at the University of Miami, and I hope they all talk about their experience. Dee Dee Bridgewater began touring internationally with the University of Illinois Big Band. Uh, Terrence Blanchard got his big break with uh, Art Blakey's Jazz Messengers while he was a student at Rutgers. And then there's Herbie Hancock, this young man here. I think he's still about 25 or something, so he's a prodigy. But he arrived as a freshman at Grinnell College. And when he got to school, he was torn between his passions for music and for electrical engineering. OK, so let's just stop there, because see, <laughs> dang, all right? And even after he decided to be a musician, he used his engineering background to experiment with electronic instruments to create whole new landscapes of sound. Uh, today, as you all should know, if you are real students of jazz, he is one of the most influential jazz pianists and composers in history with 14 Grammys to his name. Just saying. <laughs> and I think that Herbie's story illustrates an important point. Uh, that while the folks 
on the stage are now legends. Uh, they spent plenty of long years really mastering the fundamentals first, you know. Um, and the same hopefully will be true for all of you. For those of you who want to be musicians, that means that before you can improvise and do those solos, you got to practice those scales, you got to understand the mu music theory, you got to get down to the nuts and bolts before you can do this. If you want to be something else, if you want to, you know, be a teacher or a doctor or a lawyer or president of the United States, you got to buckle down in class, which means when you get to college, you got to blow it out. You got to take your classes seriously, which means go to class every day, which sometimes feels like an option when you're in college, if we all remember, but you need to go to class. You need to take good notes. You need to raise your hand. You need to be focused in school because you're paying for it. So you're going to feel the pain when you leave, so you might as well get your money's worth. And I want you all to throw yourselves into all the activities that Campus Life brings if you're going to campus, which means join clubs, be involved in extracurricular activities, don't sit in your dorm room alone. That is not the college experience. You're not supposed to get through college on your own, so you gotta break out. And the most important thing I tell young people headed to college is ask for help. Do not be afraid to ask for help. That is the thing that dooms college students. They think they should do it all alone, and no one gets through college or anything in life without a whole lot of help. So the minute you start feeling a little out of sorts, the minute you feel like you're falling behind, you don't think you understand something in class, there are a whole array of people who are there to help you, from counselors to RAs to tutoring centers to you name it. But you got to find them. They're not going to come looking for you. That's the difference in college. They expect you to be grown up and identify your needs and go after it, okay? But if you guys do all of that, the sky's the limit. You know, you can be great musicians, you can be legends in your own time, you can be the president of the United States, you can do whatever you want. This stuff isn't rocket science. Well, to be what they're, you, you have to have some talent. It's like, I can't do anything these people can do. But you all, all can do what I do, if you choose to. Uh, so I hope that you use this time here to really ask questions. Don't be nervous when I leave, the press will leave, so, you know, you'll be okay. <laughs> ask questions, get the wisdom from these folks. They are here for you. We are here for you all. Um, and have some fun along the way. And to all our students going to college, I wish you all the very, very, very best of luck. Uh, you've got a president and a first lady who are behind you all every step of the way. Just remember, when you hit a barrier, that's when you grow. So don't let that shut you down, because we've all had our trials and tribulations. We've all failed big in some way, shape, or form. The question isn't whether you fail, it's how you get up and move on. So keep it up, all right? Until then, just have a good time here this morning, all right? And with that, I'm going to go do some more work, but I'm going to turn it, turn it over to Herbie Hancock and our musicians who are going to take it away for you guys. All right? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. Now, actually, I have some remarks. Right there, that you're gonna hand to me right now. Thank you very much. How are you guys doing today? Fantastic. So it's uh, always an honor to be in the White House. And, and today is a very special day because we're honoring International Jazz Day with this education program. Uh, this morning we've assembled a group of some of the most talented jazz, young jazz artists in the world who study at uh, the Lonnie Spunk Institute of Jazz Performance at the University of California in Los Angeles, UCLA. And they're gonna take us on a, a jazz journey. You wanna go on a jazz journey? Okay. And explore the history of this American treasure. But, you know, uh, I'm not here to do a lot of talking, uh, so I'm gonna sit down and maybe start playing something and maybe some of my friends will join me. L let's see how that works out, okay? 
Let's see, I gotta put this microphone somewhere.
I think I'll let uh, Daniel Rodham uh, take over for right now, okay? Thank you very much. Are we on? Are we on? Hello? Thank you very much, Herbie. I um, want to thank also Mrs. Obama and welcome all of you um, here today. Uh, such an extraordinary welcome such a pleasure and honor to be here at the White House today with you all, celebrating International Jazz Day. We are the Thelonious Monk Institute of Jazz Performance Ensemble, where all students at UCLA hear about Bird School of Music. As you can all see, we have those little pins to... Um, as part of our program, we were selected by Herbie, uh, Wayne Shorter, Kenny Burrell, James Newton and Jimmy Heath, all jazz legends. And we were selected for this two-year master program at UCLA, where we get to study with some of the most amazing living jazz musicians in the world. Uh, just recently, we had Terry Lynn coming and working with us, Chris Potter, um, Danilo Perez, just to name a few. In addition to that, we get to perform and travel. Last year, we played in Paris for International Jazz Day. Um, followed by a U.S. Department tour to Morocco, where we had the privilege to play with Dee Dee Bridgewater and Herbie Hancock, who you just heard. The last thing that I will mention to you that we do in our program is give back to the community. One of the things we do is go and give outreach programs and clinics, one of them you're about to see here today. 
Now, we know that many of you are about to take an important step in your development as human beings as you finish high school and start college. I'm not sure if many of you know, but today happens to be Duke Ellington's birthday. He was born on this day in 1899. And I wanted to share a little quote with you that I find as relevant today as ever. Duke said, the most important thing I look for in a musician is whether he can listen and whether he knows how to listen. As we give you this clinic today, exploring the history of jazz, we want to encourage you to listen to the history. Listen to the people that came before you and us. Listen to the masters of this music. And just as important, listen to yourself as you take this important step and join all of us in trying to make the world a better place, one step at a time. Now, let us go on our jazz history journey. Um, our first step is a music called Ragtime. Ragtime started as piano music. It was quite popular at the time. People would buy piano rolls. Um, our pianist, Carmen, will now demonstrate a part of a song called The Entertainer, written by Scott Joplin. When you listen to it, notice the steady left hand and the syncopated rhythms played by the right hand. Carmen. Thank you, Carmen. So our next stop on our jazz history journey is New Orleans. New Orleans in the beginning of the 1900s was a poor town and attracted many immigrants from a lot of places around the world. As a result of that, many cultures got blended in together. And this is essentially the birthplace of jazz. What we call this period in jazz is early jazz, one of the pioneers is of course Louis Armstrong, the great trumpet player, which I'm sure many of you heard about. This next song we'll play for you is called After You've Gone. And when you listen to it, listen for how the horn, the horns up front improvise while the soprano plays the melody, the main head of the song. So this is After You've Gone. After you've gone, um, I'm sure you've noticed. We seem to have some. There we go. Um, one thing that I forgot to mention to you that I'm sure you've heard was the beat played by the drums. That is called the New Orleans kind of groove. Um, we're moving on in our trip, and now we're getting to a period called the swing era. So the swing era had an important thing to it, and that was swing was the popular music of the time. Around the 1930s and early 1940s, people would go out and dance to swing music. That is amazing. Um, some of the important big bands of the time were the Duke Ellington's band, Duke, we've mentioned him before, and Count Basie's band. And I have to tell you something. 
a personal note. We got to do this clinic many times before, but today is really special because today we have some of Jazz's history living legends here with us. And for this next one that we'll play for you, I want to invite to the stage the incredible Dee Dee Bridgewater. <laughs> this, this next song we'll play for you is entitled It Don't Mean a Thing If It Ain't Got That Swing by Duke Ellington. Thank you. You don't mean a thing. All you got to do is sing. Do up 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 do wow. It makes no difference if it's sweet or hot. Just give that rhythm everything you got. Well, it don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. Do up 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 do up. I didn't do it on the day, scooting to the bed, lay down for a young dog. I didn't lay down for a young dog. I'm scooting to the bed, lay down for a young dog. I didn't 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 lay down for a young dog. Didi. Wow. Thank you, Didi. So our next stop in our jazz history journey is a con somewhat of a controversial, controversial movement at the time. Um, this one is called bebop, the bebop era. Now, bebop musicians, many of them originated in the swing era, but where they used to play in big bands before, in the bebop era, we see smaller groups. So instead of having a big band of 20 musicians on stage, we now had smaller groups with two or three horns playing at the front. Now, bebop compared to swing had a few changes in the very basic elements of the music. A lot of times, the tempo of the songs were, was much faster. The harmony was more complex compared to swing. Now, for this next one, it's my honor to invite to the stage the amazing Bobby Watson. <laughs> this next song you will hear will feature Bobby and our trombone player, Ido. This one is called Anthropology by the great Charlie Parker. Thank you.
Bobby Watson, ladies and gentlemen. Now, in the late 1950s and the early 1960s, a new movement rose. Many of the bebop musicians felt like the music became more about listening and didn't communicate as much with the audience. So we see a return to the gospel roots of the music and much more influence from blues in the music. Now we have a very, very special treat here today. I've been waiting for this moment and feeling excited about it for a long time now. We have with us two of the former members of one of the most incredible artists of that period of time, Art Blakey. We have two of them here with us today. And I'm really excited we have Bobby Watson here with us and I'm excited to invite Terence Blanchard to play with us. This, this next one we'll play for you is from the repertoire of the Art Blakey Jazz Messengers Band. This one was composed by Bobby Timmons and is called Monin. Thank you. 
Bobby Watson, Terrence Blanchard, thank you. So next, we're getting into a very interesting subject. We often see in history how arts, and specifically music, reflect the times. And now we're getting to the 1960s, which was a very unstable social time. Um, and now we're gonna talk about free jazz. So the movement of free jazz was closely related to the civil rights movement. And we see musicians not only expressing themselves, but expressing the spirit of the time. And in that way, and in their own specific way, starting to get, try and get away from the norm, from what is known as the sort of basic concepts of music in terms of harmony and tempo, and trying to get away from that and find their own way to explore the freedom outside of these sort of restrictions. So this next piece that we'll play for you was written by Ornette Coleman, who was a great alto player and composer. And this one is called Lonely Woman. Thank you. Thank you. As you heard, the horns were playing the melody while the rhythm section were playing behind, but it wasn't necessarily all together. It was very free. Now we're getting to the last stop on our history of jazz journey. Um, this will be fusion, what became known as fusion. Now, the fusion musicians had a whole new influence on their jazz and music, the influence of rock and roll. So in fusion, we see the introduction of synthesizers as part of the ensembles and music. And w we were all very fortunate to hear earlier today one of the very pioneers of the fusion, Herbie Hancock, of course. Now this next song we'll play for you is one of Herbie's compositions. And this one is called Actual Proof. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, before we get into our question and answer um, part of this clinic, I would like to take a moment and have every member of the Thelonious Monk Ensemble present themselves and tell you, share with you guys what their educational experience was. So, who wants to, maybe Carmen, you want to start? Washington, and I was very lucky because I was exposed to jazz. I have an older brother who plays the tenor saxophone, so when I was young, I played classical piano, but he uh, introduced me to jazz when I was you know, pretty young, so I got into it, and I went to a high school that had a great jazz program. Maybe some of you guys have been playing in the band or the orchestra in your high school. Um, and then I went on, I took some time off to study music in between, and then I went on to a double degree program at Tufts University and New England Conservatory. Is anyone going to Tufts or NEC here? Anyone? All right, well, I still don't. <laughs> um, yeah, and that's, so that's kind of my story. I did the academic side and the music side at the same time, and I studied anthropology at Tufts, and I found that um, that academic study has really helped me as a musician and kind of informed my way of approaching music from a multicultural perspective, and that's part of jazz today. So um, I encourage you, if you have interests that are academic, to pursue those along with your music, and it'll, it'll help. So my name is Michael, Michael Mayo, and um, I've been singing since I was about yay high. Um, both of my parents are musicians. My mom is a professional singer and my dad is a professional saxophone player. So for me growing up, um, music was always around and it always actually made sense to see someone who was pursuing a professional music career. It always just seemed like something that was very possible because I had two living examples right there day to day. Um, and so I went to high school. I went to the LA County High School for the Arts in Los Angeles. And um, from there, I also went to New England Conservatory uh, to get my bachelor's degree. And um, people had been, a lot of people that I, that taught at my high school actually were graduates of the Monk Institute or had been involved with the Monk Institute in some sort of way. So I had known of the Monk Institute, you know, in high school and growing up. And then when I got to college, someone mentioned the, pro the college program again to me. And I was like, maybe I should check it out. So uh, I went online and I found the application and I looked at the requirements and, um, I decided to apply, and I guess the, the rest is history, and uh, it's really great to get a chance to be at the White House. It's very surreal, hasn't really quite sunk in yet, but yeah, that's my story. You're tall. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name's Christian Human. Uh, I'm the drum set player in the Monk Institute, and uh, I, my, my dad is sort of a freelance, part-time electric bass player and grew up playing gospel music and R&B music. Um, I grew up in the church, so that's sort of where my musical beginnings came from. And uh, I began studying um, in my middle school when I was in fifth grade. And uh, that continued until through high school and until I went to the Western Michigan University in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Anybody? Any Broncos in here? Okay. <laughs> um, and I studied a tiny bit of classical percussion, but mainly jazz drum set there. And um, now I'm in the Monk Institute. So, and also, I share the same uh, feeling Michael has. It's absolutely incredible to be here and definitely to play for you guys. So, thank you so much. Hello. Hi, my name's Alex Bonham. I'm from Sydney, Australia. So, long way from home. Uh, I went to the, I, I mean, my, I just went to the Conservatorium of Music in Sydney, which is attached to the Sydney University. Any Sydney University? No. <laughs> No, I didn't think so. So, no, and, uh, yeah, I, I went to school there and uh, did a lot of traveling as well uh, around, after leaving school, I lived in Europe for a while and um, before, before coming here and doing my master's. So, um, yeah, that's my story and loving it here. It's awesome. Thanks. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I am David Otis. I play those things. Um, from California, down in California. Um, my pops is a saxophone player, so by default, I had to play it. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, I went to Fullerton College, didn't graduate, I mean, transferred to Cal State Northridge, and that's where I got my undergrad. And now I'm here with these knuckleheads. <laughs> so, yeah, you guys are great. Woo! <laughs> Hi, 
right, everybody's so short. Mm. Oh, whatever. Here. Yeah, Help me out here, man. All right, so uh, my name is Ido, and I play the trombone. Uh, I started playing when I was very young. My dad is a professional trombone player, so he just bought one home, put it in my hands, and the rest is history. <laughs> um, and I went to Berkeley College of Music, and I saw at least one Berkeley shirt right here, so good representation. <laughs> um, so this is where I did my guard, and um, now I'm here, just like the rest of them. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Daniel. Um, I was born in Jerusalem, Israel. Um, I did my undergrad at Berkeley as well, in Boston. So, um, just want to share a personal experience with you. When I was in high school, I heard about this program that we're a part of. And I remember thinking, this is like the Olympus. That's the one thing that's forever going to be out of reach. And I'm very, very grateful to be here with these lady and gentlemen um, playing music for you. You've been a wonderful audience. Um, before we open up for questions, um, we're going to play one more song for you. And this one um, sort of represents the current state of things and what we do. Um, we took a pop song and we arranged it, mostly Michael arranged it. Um, this one is, I'm sure you'll recognize it, I Can't Help It. By surprise, I can't help but see you running off in through my mind, and I'm helpless like a baby, sensual disguise, and I can't help but love you. It's getting better all the time. I can't help it if I wanted to, wouldn't help it. Even if I could, I can't help it. If I wanted to, wouldn't help it. No, I can't help it if I wanted to, wouldn't help it. Even if I could, I can't help it. If I wanted to, wouldn't help it. No, and I'd love to run my fingers softly while you sigh. Love came and possessed you, bringing sparkles to your eyes like a trip to heaven. Heaven is the prize, and I'm so glad I found you. It's getting better all the time. I can't help it if I wanted to, wouldn't help it. Even if I could, I can't help it. If I wanted to, wouldn't help it. No, I can't help it. If I wanted to, wouldn't help it. Even if I could, I can't help it. If I wanted to, wouldn't help it. No.
surprise I can't help but see you Running off into my mind And I'm helpless like a baby Sensual disguise And I'm so glad I found you It's getting, it's getting better all the time I can't help it if I wanted to Wouldn't help it Even if I could, I can't help it If I wanted to, wouldn't help it No, I can't help it If I wanted to, wouldn't help it Even if I could, I can't help it If I wanted to, wouldn't help it No, I can't help it If I wanted to, wouldn't help it Even if I could, I can't help it If I wanted to, wouldn't help it No, I can't help it If I wanted to, wouldn't help it Even if I could, I can't help it If I wanted to, wouldn't help it No Thank you very much. Thank you. Again, you've been a wonderful audience. I want to thank the artists one more time. Such a pleasure and honor to play with you. And for this next part of our presentation, I want to invite the West Coast Director of the Thelonious Monk Institute of Jazz, Mr. Daniel Seif. Thank you all for being such a great and attentive and enthusiastic audience. Uh, I'd like to ask our, can we have our special guests on these stools here so you can be in a position to be um, asked for your wisdom? You guys have wisdom. <laughs> oh yeah, this is fine too. Actually, that's good. So, um, what we want to do for the next few minutes is just take questions from everybody. We have these seven great young musicians who all went to different schools for undergrad. They're all at UCLA now for their masters. We have our three special guests. We, we lost one of our guests who went to Grinnell, but we have our three that uh, went to University of Illinois, Rutgers, and University of Miami. And uh, so these questions, so everybody here is a musician, correct? And is everybody, everybody here is going to college? And is everybody studying music in college? Some people said no. Okay, that's fine. We're not here to sell you on doing that. If you want to do that, that's great. But uh, So now's the time to ask questions of any of the people you see up here. So do we have some questions from the audience? Terrence, do you have thoughts about that? Okay. It's called prayer. No. Um, <laughs> no, I, I think I, I, the thing about procrastination is that you have to set goals for yourself, right? And when you set goals for yourself, you try to whittle away at it every day. That's the thing. The main thing about procrastination is, is that I think that comes from when people consider themselves being perfectionists. You know what I mean? Sometimes when I was a kid, when I was in high school, I had to throw away that idea of perfection. And the reason why is because it never allowed me to get started. Because by me trying to be perfect, I kept saying, oh man, uh, you know, this is not gonna be cool. So in my mind, I never would get started. So I had to throw it out of the way. My thing was to throw away perfection, but when, as Wayne Shorter just told me right before this rehearsal, it's not, it's not, the end of the journey, it's the journey. It's the, it's the, you know, it's the pursuit is the thing. So I would say to you, get started. Just make it, make it up in your mind every day for everybody in the room. When you wanna do something, just say, let me just get started. Don't think about what you have to do in terms of the entire day, just get started. And when you get started, you're gonna find that you, your focus is gonna change, because as soon as you start to, as soon as I start pulling up my horn, I practice, I go, uh, oh, that was awful, let me do it again, uh, okay, wait a minute, I need to do that a couple more times, boom, 
Next thing you know, I'm working on my attack or I'm working on my fingering and an hour has gone by. You know what I mean? Whereas if I'm not even in the realm of starting, I'm still pushing that thing away. And here's the, here's the real dilemma about this that I always tell all my students, right? It ain't going nowhere. You know what I mean? It's sitting there waiting on you, right? So either you're gonna tackle it or you're not. Here's the other one too that somebody told me that really blew my mind. And this is, this is the one that really made me start to practice. He said, you don't have to practice. Don't practice, don't ever practice. You don't have to practice. He said, but let me just tell you, somewhere around the world right now, there's a kid that plays your instrument that's practicing every day. Either you could be the kid whose CDs they buy, or you could be the kid buying other kids' CDs. That scared me to death. <laughs> other questions? I think that we are here today because we really love what we're doing. And we all know, because we've been doing this for a while, the importance of growth as an artist, the importance of pushing yourself, pushing that envelope. Um, I believe that we all share the fact that it is important to give back once you have reached a certain level in your professionalism to try and help young musicians or young people in any area to get a better idea of what it is they want to do and how they can do it. Um, as a singer, I have always pushed myself to do something different, something new. I have never been happy with sitting still and staying in one category or just addressing one style of music. And I think that this is something that you are all going to need to develop. And being in college or university is going to help you get started on that path. But what are you gonna do when you get out? If you haven't developed any kind of a discipline, if you haven't set some goals for yourself, if you haven't tried to, to push yourself into, I don't know, just to push yourself harder, to make yourself be the best that you can, you will be stuck being mediocre. So I think that's why we're still here. We push ourselves. We're always trying to explore different avenues Yes, um, as you, as uh, uh, Terrence and Didi have said, there was two words that they both said. Uh, one is discipline and setting goals. And you're about to enter a phase in your life where uh, you have to, artists have self-discipline. See, we, we don't need anybody to tell us. I mean, we get the little words of wisdom like, you know, you better, you don't have to practice because somebody else will, you know. So you're like, okay, that, I'm, now my motor's running. Okay, no, 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 I'm, I'm ready now. So you guys have been made to do things your whole life. You, somebody will tell you, and that's where procrastination comes in, see? Because you know you have an assignment on Thursday, you're going to procrastinate till Wednesday night. But you're going to have to do it, you see? And if you go to the military, you're going to have to get up and, at 5 in the morning and hit the deck and, and do your push-ups for Uncle Sam. You know, if you work at Macy's, you're going to have to get there and punch that clock for them. But artists, we do it on our own because we want to do it. And we set goals like they said. You heard those two words, setting goals and discipline. So that's gonna, what you're going to need, and that eliminates procrastination. You know, because by the time you guys get to college, you guys are professional procrastinators. You know, you're professional, you know, what do I need to do to get an A? 
Oh, that's it? Okay, well, you know, you know you're, you're, way, you're professionals, you know. In Penn, if you make it into college, you're really a pro, you know. You know, you know what you're doing on that student game, you know. So, you know, think about what's going, coming in front of you, and that's why, you know, we still do it, you know. Man, there's so many reasons why I'm here. Uh, I can't even count them. I think the first one is obvious. You know, you know, Didi talked about giving back. You know, um, and it and it's all connected. You know, when I when you first asked that question, first thing came to my mind was Milt Hinton and Clark Terry. Those are two great musicians who I met in my high school, and they came to my high school and uh, read us the riot act, really, you know, and gave back. But also, it's important to know that this music has come a long way, man. It's come a long way. To have the International Jazz Day is huge, huge. You cannot imagine. And I'm looking at your faces and I'm saying all of these guys, all of you guys are, you know, uh, you know, uh, agreeing to go to college, that's a beautiful thing because even when I was coming along, there were certain schools that didn't teach jazz. Musicians, they were, they were fighting for respect, you know, in, not only in the community but around the world. We all know as musicians what it takes to be a jazz musician, but that wasn't always the respected thing in this country, you know. So to come this far, to see all of you here, you know, and to have this at the White House, man, you can't understand. You know, I, I, I get emotional thinking about the people like Dizzy Gillespie and Art Blakey and some of those people who aren't around to see this because that's what they talked about, you know. When I got on the scene in the, well, we don't need to talk about the date, but when I came on the scene, you know, they were excited for us because we were some of the first to come out of high school that studied jazz, right? And they, you know, they were excited about us, but that still didn't mean that jazz was being taught in the colleges, you know? Julio didn't have a jazz program back then, you know? Now everybody has a jazz program, right? And that speaks volumes about the music, it speaks volumes about the history of people like Herbie Hancock, Dee Dee, and this guy over here, Bobby, and everything that they've put in to this art form, right? And for you guys to be here, where else would we wanna be? you know, trying to share this information. Because the main thing that we're really trying to tell you, you know, and I know it's hard sometimes because you look at guys who are successful, but the main thing we're really trying to tell you is that if we're doing this, dude, you could do it. Yeah. We're no different. We're no different, you know. When Maynard Ferguson's band came to New Orleans, man, they had a master class, you should have seen us. It was, it, you know, it, it, it was like a clandestine thing, you know, and, and everybody who showed up was really cool because you knew about it, you know what I mean? And while we were there, we were just scared little kids trying to ask questions. Well, how do you practice? How do you do this? And we got all this information from those guys and we would take it back and work hard at it. Now it's in the university. Now you have it at your fingertips. Now you have it at the click of a button. You know what I mean? Take advantage of it. Please, take advantage of it because people have worked hard to get it to this point. You know, and I think the other thing that's really important about us being here is that being an artist, being a jazz musician, means you got to deal with truth. You cannot lie to yourself. Either you know what you're doing, you know, or others will know that you're not doing what you should be doing, right? So it's important, you know, in this day and age that we're living in right now, it's important for us to deal with truth. I think we have some students from Duke Ellington School that have brought their instruments. Is that right? I'm looking at you guys, you look sort of stunned. Well, we'd like to have at least the horn players come up and play on the last tune. If you could get ready to do that, we'll, we'll take another question while you're getting ready, but. Okay, yeah. Well, in my short life, I've seen things go in cycles. And uh, I think that um, big bands uh, 
will make another appearance, and they already are. They really already are. So <clears throat> I think that uh, uh, a real instruments, I mean, what am I trying to say? The traditional instruments, trumpets, saxophones, drums, basses, vocals, I mean, violins and live music. I think that there's a, there's a place for that. I don't think it'll be like, it, uh, it won't be like it was, you know, back in the day, because Duke and them guys were like pop stars. You know, they had hits on the radio and people would dance to those. And, but then again, it goes in cycles. You know, I see bell bottoms coming back and, <laughs> and, and afros. <laughs> As I'm saying, and the God forbid, not the high platform hills. <laughs> but they're all coming back around, you know. It's, so, I mean, who knows? We just got to keep living and stay open. Just stay open. Hey, man, listen. You know, big bands can come back. It all depends on what you do with it. You know what I mean? It's all about what you do with it. Right. The, thing, the, the, the cool thing about being a jazz musician, bro, is that we have free reign. You know what the tradition of jazz is? To break tradition. Yeah. That's the tradition. Yeah. So, you know, here's the thing that, that, that has to happen. Sometimes when we get involved in this music, we kind of think that it's etched in stone, and we go, oh, man, I play the trumpet. I got to play like Clifford Brown or Freddie Hubbard. Not the case. I need to study them, for sure, to understand what they did and where they came from, right? But all of those little things that I love, I grew up listening to Parliament Funkadelic. I grew up listening to Mandrill. I grew up listening to a lot of different things, Weather Report, along with Miles Davis, right? So all of that stuff comes to bear, right? So I know with you guys, this is, you got Kendrick, you got a whole bunch of stuff you guys are in. I know. I got kids. I don't understand what's happening, you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so you have all of those things, right? So all of those things are influences. All of those things have rhythms. All of those things have musical colors. Don't shy away from them if you're going to write for Big Man. Why? Right? right? You know, it's an art form, dude. It's about your particular voice. If you have something yearning inside of you that needs to come out, you need to deal with it. And, and, and listen, this is therapy. Music is supposed to heal people. So the only way it's going to heal is by you being honest. OK, so we're going to bring some students from uh, Duke Ellington School. So what's your name? Where are you going to college? Um, I don't know yet. Doesn't know. Okay, he's a junior. <laughs> and on tenor, we have Gabrielle. And where are you going to, where are you going to school? Oh, she's a junior. Are, is everyone here juniors? No. Oh, senior. And where are you going to school? Tennessee State. Tennessee State, okay. And what's your name? Okay, and on drums? And uh, on piano, okay. you're a senior? Junior, junior okay, all right. Um, and I'm going to ask uh, if our guests will, will join them, if you're willing. Sure. Uh, and do you guys, what would you guys like to do? We, we had told everyone to have Blue Monk, Straight No Chaser, or Now's the Time Prepared. Are you ready to do those, one of those? Well, what did you want to play? What blues did you want to play? What blues do you want to play? Uh, I know Blue Monk, right? Blue Monk? Blue Monk? Okay.
Beautiful job. Beautiful job, guys. Yeah, the Duke Ellington High School for the Arts. Beautiful. As we close um, our event today, we want to thank you all for being such a wonderful audience. Um, before I introduce one more time the members of the Thelonious Monk Institute Ensemble, I would like to dedicate this very special thanks to our amazing guests, yeah. Didi Bridgewater, yeah. Bobby Watson, yeah. Terence Blanchard, yeah. and of course, Mr. Herbie Hancock. We want to thank one more time Mr. President and the First Lady for hosting International Jazz Day here at the White House. Such an incredible thing to be a part of. And lastly, uh, the members of the Thelonious Monk Institute Ensemble, if we can all gather up. You've listened to Carmen Staff on piano, Alex Bonham on the bass, Christian Newman on drums, Mr. David Otis on alto, Ido Meshulam on trombone, Michael Mayo, our vocalist, and my name is Daniel. Thank you very much for listening today. Thank you. <laughs>